My name is Linda Freed, and I have the great honor of welcoming you as the Dean of Columbia University's Mammon School of Public Health. As you may know, this year's Grand Rounds series is dedicated to discussing public health as a public good. The foundation of successful societies because we are responsible for creating healthy populations, delivering the science that can underpin that and the solutions to accomplish it. So far, we this year, we have devoted substantial time to understanding the importance of investing in the science of public health and, public, and the public's health itself to more effectively create a healthier population. Today's lecture is a cherished part of our Hamid Fellows Program which is directed by Dr. Kavita Siva Ramakrishnan. I would like to turn this over to Kavita in just a moment so she can make some very special introductions. Before I do, I want to warmly welcome Yusuf and Farida Hamid, without whom this vital India-US partnership would not be possible. Dr. Hamid, as you know, the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health is celebrating its centennial by looking forward to the next century in public health priorities and goals. Your industrial and generous philanthropic leadership is an exemplar. Your career-long dedication to improving global health through producing and providing access to drugs and changing the opportunity for people to have them has rapidly and, and um, indelibly changed the game for HIV treatment. And I trust today that Dr. Kong's talk will resonate loudly for you. We are very fortunate to have you and Farida in our Columbia Mailman family. And on behalf of all our Hamid fellows and distinguished lecturers, thank you for your investment in this really important and growing bilateral program, essential to understanding and achieving healthier environments, improved access to treatment, and reduced risk factors for ill health across the life course for culturally diverse populations across India. Yusuf, as we conclude the first year of Melman's second century, I deeply appreciate your commitment to public health, to the Melman School, to India, and to our shared vision of what we can create together through the Hamid program. And now I would like to ask Kavita Siva Ramakrishnan to share news of our latest Hamid Fellows. Thank you, Linda. And thank you, Dr. Hamid and Farida Hamid. And congratulations on your anniversary, as you shared with us just now. Uh, the success of this program is very much due to the efforts of the Mailman team with whom I'm delighted to work. My thanks, especially to advisors and selection committee members, especially to Lynn, Fr Lynn Friedman, and Gary Miller, and to Caitlin Hawk for the energy and expertise she brings to her role as senior administrator, as well as to Rosine Musa for deeply valued contributions as well. A special thanks to Lauren Signella for her efforts on behalf of today's lecture, and a very warm welcome to our counterparts in the Hamid program, Ravina Agarwal and Shama Kamat at the Columbia Global Center in Mumbai. Almost every Mailman School department chair has lent support to this program, along with departmental administrators and some two dozen Mailman faculty members who have been excellent partners in helping us to embed our most recent visiting fellows in the life and the research terrain of the Mailman School. So I want to extend a very warm and special thanks to SMS, Kathy Sikema, to EPI, to Charlie Brannis, to PopFam, Terry McGovern, HPM, Michael Sperer, Larry Brown, and Talia Portney, and to EHS, Andrea Baccarelli, Anna Navies Asien, and Darby Jack. We are here for dual purposes, both to hear, of course, our distinguished speaker, as well as to congratulate the 2022 and 2023 cohorts of the Hamid Research Fellows. As you can see in the India map that will just come up, uh, with the following scholars, we now count 24 fellows in our bilateral exchange program with the Indian public health research community. In this map, as you'll see, maybe we can shift to the map. It's, it's the next slide. 
Um, in this map, what we have is an entire country from literally from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Delhi to the south, uh, where we have dozens of participating institutions across India who worked with us. So in particular, I want to acknowledge our long-standing partnerships with the Public Health Foundation of India, the Indian Institute of Public Health, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And now in the next slide, I want to show you all our fellows since the inception of the program. So it makes me hugely proud to be able to show you this. Please join me in congratulating also our most recent awardees from India, all of whom I'm absolutely thrilled to say are with us as we speak today in New York, visiting the Mailman School of Public Health for research residencies. So we have Aparijita Chattopadhyay, who's professor at the Indian Institute of Population Sciences in Mumbai, the IIPS, Shankar Das, Dean and Professor of the School of Health System Studies at TIS, Shaumitro Ghosh, who is Associate Professor, School of Health System Studies at the Center of Health Policy at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Daksha Parmar, Assistant Professor, Development Studies, who's at the Indian Institute of Technology in Guwahati, Hari Sajiraju, who's Assistant Professor, Preventive Oncology at the National Cancer Institute and the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, Alan Ugargol, who's Associate Professor of practice at the Center for Public Policy at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And in the next slide, you'll see the latest awardees from the Mailman School of Public Health. And that's Pam Factor Litwack, Professor of Epidemiology, Lauren Houghton, Assistant Professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Catherine Schilling, Assistant Professor, Department of Environment, Health Sciences, and Head of the Mailman School's Meta Lab core facility, and Parisa Terinifar, Associate Professor in the Department of Epidemiology. So I want to extend on behalf of everyone in the team, a warm welcome to our new fellows uh, for wel welcome, welcoming you to join our Hamuth community, which is two dozen strong now. And Dean Freed, on that uh, very positive and welcome note, I want to hand back to you to introduce our distinguished speaker for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita. And, and now it, it is my real honor to introduce our speaker for today. As we thought about who would be the ideal thought leader to deliver this distinguished Hamid lecture during the Columbia Mailman Centennial, we contemplated a lot how 200 years of public health successes and particularly those since the advent of the antibiotic and vaccine era have actually doubled our life expectancy. That is a profound achievement in the history of human health. And the role of vaccines, of course, to prevent infectious disease and to protect the health and well being of children and people across the whole life course has been a critically important driver and investment in the creation of longevity. And to think about the future with us. I can think of no better leader than Dr. Gagandeep Kang, who carries forward this stunning 20th century achievement. Dr. Kang is a physician scientist in the Division of Gastrointestinal Sciences at Christian Medical College in Valor. She's renowned for her work to prevent enteric infections in children. In India, she has built national rotavirus and typhoid surveillance networks to estimate disease burden, test vaccines, and inform policy. She created a robust infrastructure for vaccine trials to improve access to treatment and has spent much of her career investigating how healthy gut function leads to physical and brain health. To Dr. Kang's great credit, she has been a leader in training the next generation of scientists, clinicians, and public health practitioners through the robust training program she has designed in clinical translational medicine and in public health to tackle the most pressing threats to childhood health in India. Dr. Kang has many career crowning achievements and awards, including her election in 2019 as a fellow in the UK's Royal Society. I believe we have um, a duo on the screen of both Dr. Hamid and Dr. Khan. 
as elected members of the Royal Society, and we're very proud um, to honor both of you. So, and I'm honored beyond words to introduce our 2023 Yusuf Hamid Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Gaganvi Khan. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dean Fried. I'm really honored to be asked to deliver the Yusuf Hamid Distinguished Lecture for 2023. And when you're talking about Dr. Hamid, he is uh, the example of access that the world knows about, but needs to know even more about. So I'm really pleased to talk about access to another public health intervention, which is vaccines. Um, if we look at access and equity, they really are at the heart of public health. The WHO designed its triple billion targets. It designed them for 2023. Um, of course, we had a little bit of a blip in the middle, but the idea really was that there would be 1 billion more people enjoying better health and well being, 1 billion more people protected from health emergencies, and 1 billion more people who would have access to UHC. Now, when we look at both pandemics and times outside of pandemics, it's really important to remember the base that we start from. The place and the circumstances of our birth still remains the major predictor of how we will do in terms of health, education, and employment. So in this lecture, what I'm going to be walking you through is selected indicators of access to India and then talk about vaccines as a public good and in India. Um, I'd like to tell you something about the vaccine that I've worked most on, which is rotavirus vaccine outside of a pandemic, and then about COVID-19 vaccines in India during the pandemic and also think a little bit together about the way forward. So if we look at indicators of access in India, there are many ways of measuring how the population is doing, what it can access in terms of public health. So I took a few examples and just to set up the next few slides for you, in the slides that have the blues and the reds, these are data from the National Family Health Survey, the fifth survey that was conducted a couple of years ago, and the data released last year. This is data for 2020-21, and it's organized by parliamentary constituency. And then in the green and red map, what you have is what is the difference between the previous National Family Health Survey, NFHS 4 and 5. So one way to look at it is this is status quo, but what was the trajectory for us to get here? If we look at sanitation, the government has been engaged in sanitation uh, under the Swachh Bharat mission for several years. And the greens show us that there has been really pretty good improvement in the country. About 260 parliamentary constituencies had really the highest improvement, 261 more showed some improvement, very few worsened. Now, if we go back to the blue and red map, you can see that there continue to be areas where improved sanitation is still not present despite all the efforts of the government. If we look at clean cooking fuel by parliamentary constituency, this again is a key initiative undertaken by the government to provide cooking gas to women so that they don't have to use biomass fuels in their homes. What you can see here again is quite remarkable improvement between 2016 and 2021, but the same parts of the country that had poor water and sanitation also have lower access to clean cooking fuels. 
If we look at the status of another flagship program, we are currently uh, in the middle of a program called Anemia Mukt Bharat, Anemia Free India. And you can see that perhaps for anemia, we are not doing as well as we did for sanitation or for uh, the availability of cooking fuel, both in terms of distribution of where women are more anemic, as well as in the rate of improvement, we can see that there is quite a division across the country. And in fact, we begin to see that there are many parliamentary constituencies in India where the status of anemia has actually worsened over the last five years. If we look at stunting of children again, something being focused on by the Poshan Abhyan, you can see here again that progress is patchy and there continue to be areas with very high rates of stunting in India. So all of these mean that, you know, while efforts are being made, there is improvement in some areas, but in terms of both access and equity, we still have a long way to go in India. When it comes to vaccination, this until 2020, 21 was actually a really good news story for routine immunization because you can see that in the green and red map, only a very few states had significant red areas. Most of the country was showing significant improvements in their vaccination coverage. Now, moving to vaccination as a public good and in India, it's been estimated by the WHO that vaccination currently saves between two and three million lives every year through routine vaccination, not the estimates that have been made for COVID-19. Vaccines have eradicated smallpox. They've contained polio to just two endemic countries and they have greatly reduced many infectious diseases. So vaccines as a public health tool have an unmatched track record. But the impact of vaccines goes far beyond saving lives and preventing disease. Vaccination is in every sense an investment and there are benefits that accrue across a lifetime. In our public health decision-making, most often when we've looked at the burden of disease, we've looked at severe disease, we've looked at deaths, and we look at healthcare cost savings or care-related productivity gains. But that is a really narrow perspective of the value of vaccines. And more recently, there has been interest in thinking about the broader benefits of vaccination. And if you were to think about how we could capture the value of vaccines, I'll give you this example of a map that shows you all the things that can happen if we vaccinate our children. Children survive, their caregivers can work, children grow better, they have better cognition, they stay in education longer, it results in lower healthcare expenditure, and well people consume more as a society. So if we think about it, the benefits of vaccination accrue not just in terms of healthcare, but to society as a whole. But even if we look at routine immunization, there is a huge gap between rich and poor, and that's rich and poor countries and rich and poor people. So this is an example of all of the vaccines that are recommended by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. The Indian Academy of Pediatrics has about 30,000 pediatricians, the bulk of whom are in private practice and the bulk of whom give vaccines. And these are all the vaccines. You can see that the vaccines run across the spectrum up to 18 years of age. In our routine program, however, we only give vaccines up to 18 months of age. And the vaccines that are given for 
children through the routine immunization program are very limited. Just the top half, no, okay, not even the top half of the table, up to measles and rubella, here shown as MMR. MMR is given to children in the private sector and MR to children in the routine immunization program. And everything below MMR is only available to children in the private market, not in the public market. If we look at coverage of vaccines, you saw that there are many kinds of vaccines that are given to children. Some of these vaccines have been around for a long time. So BCG, the DPT, polio, measles containing vaccine, hepatitis B and hip included in the pentavalent vaccine have been around since approximately 2010. The rotavirus vaccine was introduced into the public program only in 2016. Coverage is now at about 70% and PCV only began to be introduced into the public program over the last couple of years. If we compare within the country on what's happening for routine immunization, here is data from the National Family Health Survey for Bihar and for Karnataka. I'd just like you to focus on the numbers that are under total and NFHS 4 for each state. What you can see here is that in NFHS 4, the Bihar had about 62%, just below 62% coverage of vaccines in the second year of life. Karnataka was not that different. If we look at NFHS 5, Bihar has improved by about 10% to 71%, but Karnataka has improved much more and the children now have 84% full coverage. So an improvement of about 22% in Karnataka compared to about double of what happened in Bihar. Now, if you look at the introduction of vaccines, I said we are doing very well, but I think to give you a little bit of context of India versus the world, it's good to look at this figure, which is when vaccines were introduced in the UK versus when they were introduced in India. Let's start with measles, the third vaccine on the list. Measles was introduced into the UK in 1968, in India in 1986, a gap of 18 years. If you look at Haemophilus influenza type B, it was introduced in the UK in 1992, in India in 2009. If we look at pneumococcal, we don't have meningococcal vaccine in our program, so I will skip that one. But if we look at pneumococcal disease, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine was introduced in 2006 and in India in 2020, a gap of 14 years. So while we have advanced as a country and we built our programs, there are still significant delays in our ability to protect our children. Now, while we do immunize our children, India is also known as being the country that has the maximum number of what are called zero dose children, children who have never been reached by an immunization program. Our birth cohort is between 26 and 27 million children born every year. So you can imagine the size of the vaccination program that needs to deliver at least six touch points with children in the first year of life. Now in 2021, an analysis was done looking at the characteristics of zero dose children in 92 LMIC countries. What they found was that overall in the world, in those 92 countries, there were 8% of children who were zero dose. 
But if you look at who those children were, two thirds of them lived in rural areas, a quarter of them had mothers with no education, and a quarter of them belonged to the poorest wealth quintile. Now, this is a picture that plays out across the world. What you see in red is countries within which there is a differential between rich and poor in terms of vaccines. The more red you are, the greater the differential in coverage between rich and poor within that country. You can see that India is in a shade of pink, and that means that we have a quintile difference of between 10 and 20%. And this is for the vaccine where we actually do the best, which is the DPT vaccine. Now, moving from vaccination and the inequity of vaccination across and within countries, I'd like to tell you a little bit about rotavirus. And I think for that to start, it's always good to consider what makes countries introduce vaccines. Essentially, there are three factors that are important. The first is that there should be sufficient disease and that disease should require a vaccine to prevent it. And then you need to know that you have a vaccine that works and an immunization program that is capable of delivering the vaccine. So you need country level disease burden estimates, vaccines that work and programs that can deliver. Now that's for routine vaccination, but if you look at pandemics, then you have to think about vaccines for which you might suddenly need to introduce a vaccine. And there, the threat assessment, there are many ways of doing it. One of those is the WHO's R&D blueprint, but there are agencies in the European Union, in the US and internationally like CEPI, which also define the threats for pandemics. But when we think about implementation, implementation in routine immunization and during a pandemic, built on similar infrastructure, but are actually very different in how they are operationalized. So our first case study is really going to be about routine immunization. Now, group A rotaviruses, are the most common cause of dehydrating gastroenteritis in children. You know, if you have a child that has both vomiting and diarrhea, you can understand that dehydration can happen really quite quickly, and it can be quite difficult to rehydrate a child that is dehydrated. Oral rehydration therapy can't be given when there's vomiting, and then intravenous access becomes a problem in a dehydrated child. So dehydration due to diarrhea does still kill. It's estimated that last year, about 9.8% of all deaths that occurred in children under the age of five years were due to diarrhea. In India, the percentage was a bit less, 6.6% .6 of all deaths in children under five were attributable to a diarrheal disease. Rotavirus is the commonest cause, about 40% of all diarrhea. Now for rotavirus, we actually had a vaccine that was made in 1998. This was a vaccine made by the National Institutes of Health. It followed about 20 years of research done all around the world and three doses of this vaccine were given orally at two, four, and six months, we thought we had solved the problem. That euphoria about a new rotavirus vaccine in 1998 lasted less than eight months. About 1.5 million doses of the vaccine were given, and the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System started identifying a, a possible association with intersusception. 
There were 175 cases of intersusception. It was believed that the risk of intersusception in children given the vaccine was about one in 4,000. Later, this was recalculated and revised to one in about 11,000 children who received the vaccine had intersusception. Now, the intersusception was associated with the vaccine because, as you can see from the histogram there, most of the cases of intersusception occurred in the first week after the first dose of vaccine was given. So there was an association in time in children who had been given the vaccine. The vaccine was withdrawn. A lot of discussion went on around the world saying so many children die of diarrhea in low and middle income countries. Even though this vaccine carries some risk, why can we not use it in LMICs? Because the number of lives that we will save because kids will not die of diarrhea will be much greater than the cases of intersusception that we will see. Unfortunately, at the time, WHO convened a meeting and it was very clear from low and middle income country participants that if a vaccine had been withdrawn from the US, there was no way that this vaccine was going to be used in LMICs. Now, that was quite a setback, but two companies decided to go ahead with making rotavirus vaccines. And they did trials in about 60 or 70,000 infants, GSK in 60,000, Merck in about 70,000 infants. And in 2006, we had two new rotavirus vaccines licensed. They had the trials needed to be that big in order to assess a risk of intersusception that was similar to rotashield. And when these vaccines were licensed in 2006, GSK with two doses and Merck with three doses, the total cost just for the vaccines for immunizing one child was 200 US dollars. I did a quick back of the envelope calculation looking at this year's health budget, which is about three times what it was at the time that the vaccines were introduced. And I calculated that for the Indian birth cohort, if we had to pay the price that was paid in the US for these vaccines, then immunizing one birth cohort of children with rotavirus vaccines would take about 50% of India's total health budget. So of course, there was no way that India could introduce a vaccine that was this expensive. And the companies dropped their prices when they went into other markets. For example, when they went to Brazil, they dropped their price to almost 10% of what they were charging in the US. It came down to $21 to immunize a child if Brazil agreed to buy vaccines from one company for their entire birth cohort, still unaffordable for India. The vaccines were introduced in 2008 in the Indian market for private players, and they cost 1800 for a dose of the vaccine for the GSK vaccine and 1200 a dose for the Merck vaccine. So still too expensive for our program to use. Now, in the meantime, while these vaccines were being developed in the West, we continued to make a case that there was sufficient disease burden in India to think about rotavirus vaccines. The general pushback from the public health community was, we have oral rehydration therapy, why do we need a vaccine? Our children, our rates of diarrheal deaths are declining. We came down from 18% deaths to now 7% deaths. We don't really need a vaccine. We were doing surveillance in hospitals around the country, and what we were able to show was that 37% of all children hospitalized in India with diarrhea 
had rotavirus in their stool. In high income countries, that figure is more like 50 or 60%, but 40% is the global figure for hospitalized diarrhea and an association with rotavirus. We also did a number of studies in the community with partners in different parts of the country. And what we were able to show was that if you looked at Indian children, one in every two ch children born in India would have a rotavirus diarrhea. One in eight would require an outpatient visit. One in about every 30 would need either hospitalization or supervised oral rehydration. And one in 650 children born in India would die of a rotavirus gastroenteritis. Not only was there a huge burden in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, rotavirus also had a devastating impact on families of children. We did costing studies that told us that if you had one child who was hospitalized for three days, that resulted in a 5% of annual income loss for the family. And the bulk of our families were borrowing money to pay for treatment. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the story of the development of the rotavirus vaccine. Suffice it to say that this was a vaccine where the strain was identified by Dr. Bhan during the time he was a pediatric consultant at Ames. And the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program was responsible for taking this vaccine through early phase studies in the US and later in India as well. The license for the vaccine was given to an Indian company, Bharat Biotech. They developed the vaccine. Phase one and two studies were conducted in Delhi. Phase three studies were conducted in Delhi, Pune, and Velo. And we were able to demonstrate in what was the first phase three efficacy trial for a vaccine made in India that it had about 54% efficacy against severe rotavirus gastroenteritis. Perhaps the most important thing, this vaccine could be priced at $1 a dose. This meant that we had a vaccine that could fit into our program and the vaccine was introduced into the National Immunization Program in 2016. Now, India, as I said, has a birth cohort of 27 million. So if you need to be able to vaccinate the entire birth cohort, you need over 90 million doses of vaccine. So it takes us some time to scale up. But by the end of 2019, all children in India were eligible for rotavirus vaccination. Now, we went on from introducing the vaccine to thinking about actually doing impact assessment, both for whether the vaccine was really working, but also for safety. Remember, this was the first product that was made entirely in India based on an Indian strain. So if we have to make this vaccine available to the world, we not only show that it works in efficacy trials, we also need effectiveness studies. Now, of course, because of COVID, everyone is very familiar with test negative designs, but we applied a test negative design to study uh, the impact of vaccination in India and showed that the vaccine is working that effectiveness and efficacy are approximately equivalent. But more graphic than that is this picture where the orange line shows you vaccine introduction. What you can see is that before the vaccine was introduced, rotavirus had winter seasonality as it does all over the world. And as the vaccine was introduced and coverage went up, the size of the peaks becomes smaller and smaller. So this vaccine is really preventing rotavirus gastroenteritis. 
We also monitored for safety and were able to show that unlike the clustering in the first week of the first dose that was seen with the Rotashield vaccine in the US, there was no such clustering with the three doses of Rotavac vaccine in Indian children. So we have a vaccine that is safe, that is effective, that is saving lives and keeping children out of hospital in India. That vaccine has now been pre-qualified by WHO. And as Merck and GSK reduce their commitment to Gavi, many more countries are starting to use Indian rotavirus vaccines in Africa and in Asia. So the Indian vaccines were made for India and are now serving the world. So I'll move from there to COVID-19 vaccines. And I'd like to take us back to March of 2021, where this appeal was made to G20 leaders saying, please lift patents, share vaccine technologies, let developing countries make their own vaccines because rich nations are vaccinating one person every second while the majority of the poorest nations have yet to give a single dose. Now, if we come to this week from our world in data, you can see that in India, we have vaccinated 72% of our population. And this figure looks low, but is because unlike many other countries, we have not vaccinated our younger children. In terms of number of doses, India and China, are the only countries that have over a billion population and have covered most of their populations with vaccines. If you take a look at something that is really a remarkable achievement of the Indian government, which is COVID, the app that allowed us to register, make appointments for vaccines, download our vaccination certificates, these are the figures from Sunday on the COVID app. India has given 2.2 crore vaccines. So I'm sorry, I always get the numbers wrong, but 2.2 uh, billion doses of vaccines, 200 crore, 220 crore vaccinations. And if you look at the vaccinations by type, the bulk of the vaccine used in the country is Covishield, an adenovirus vectored vaccine. Covaxin is the inactivated vaccine. And then for the booster doses, we've used Corbivax and Covovax. I think the important messages here are India imported no vaccines. And India was the only country in the world that has made vaccines on all platforms. That means we have mRNA vaccines. We have the only DNA vaccine in the world. We have the nanoparticle vaccine, Covovax. We have Corbivax, which is a recombinant protein vaccine. And we have Covishield, the adenovirus vectored vaccine, and Covaxin, the inactivated vaccine. Some of these were developed entirely in India. Some of them were in partnership with companies. Some of them were in partnership with academic organizations like the Corbivax vaccine, which was from Houston. Okay, these are the vaccines that are available in India. The one that I didn't mention, which is more recent, is Incovac, which is a nasal vaccine. CanSino in China and Bharat Biotech in India are the only two companies that have licensed nasal vaccines at the moment. Shown here in red are the vaccines made in India that have been approved by WHO. Covishield, Covaxin, Covovax, and the J&J &J vaccine that was made in India by Biological E but exported. The other vaccines are also available in India. So we have everything that is was needed to vaccinate our population. 
But how did we get to 2.2 billion doses? Well, we did have a lot of challenges along the way. There were two clinical efficacy studies in over 25,000 participants that were done by Bharat Biotech and Zydus Cadilla. The other vaccines were licensed on the basis of immunogenicity. And there were challenges in the trials in terms of recruitment, when the waves were happening, what needed to be done. Uh, we had our regulators put out a regulatory framework that resembled that of the FDA very early on, but uh, that was not quite adhered to when push came to shove. So we had vaccines approved before data on their efficacy was available. We also have issues of safety monitoring. Signal detection is something that the government has begun to focus on, but we had a lot of media hype and some tragedies because there was insufficient recognition of some of the safety events that could happen with adenovirus vectored vaccines. The COVID app had some initial glitches. It was made initially in English, which meant that some people couldn't sign up for appointments. That was rectified rapidly. And then in terms of age de-escalation, we probably went a little bit too fast because we hadn't fully immunized, immunized the elderly before we started making the vaccines available to all adults. And this led to some complexity in decision-making by government versus advisory committees. There were some disadvantages to people in rural areas who didn't have internet access in terms of making bookings. We had some anti-vaccination messaging, nothing like the US, but enough to impact vaccines for some people and in some areas. Particularly for pregnant women, a delay in decision making led to the spread of a lot of messaging that uh, resulted in low coverage. And then we had some missteps in terms of who would buy a vaccine and at what price. Nonetheless, all of these got sorted out and we got to the 2.2 billion doses. Now, COVID-19 vaccines have had globally the most rapid rollout in history. It's been estimated that they've saved 20 million lives and boosted economic recovery. Had there been greater equity in the distribution of vaccines, it's been calculated that up to 600,000 more lives could have been saved in low and middle income countries if vaccines had been more equitably distributed. Now I'd like to move forward to what the pandemic did to routine immunization. Basic vaccine coverage in low income countries essentially went down. Globally, we went from 86% to 81% in 2021. In low income countries, we started at 82% and were at 77% in 2021. This actually means that there has been, you know, every gain in immunization is hard fought for. It doesn't sound like much to go from 80% to 82%, but it takes a huge amount of effort because you're reaching that many more children. But the backsliding that we've had in immunization has been really quite incredible in 2021, 25 million children were unvaccinated or undervaccinated, and of those, 18 million were zero dose. This was 6 million children who did not access any vaccine, 6 million more than in 2019. And you can imagine that if these children were not able to access the healthcare system in order to get immunized. They're actually a susceptible cohort that is likely to remain unreached and may be badly affected by potential vaccine preventable diseases. 
Now, 10 countries account for 62% of the zero-dose children. In India, we lead for DPT-1. We have 2.7 million children, 10% of our birth cohort that has not gotten DPT-1. We have 2.5 million children that have not received measles vaccine. And this is second only to Nigeria, which has 3 million children that have not received DPT, have not received measles vaccine. If we look at the UNICEF report in 2022, you can see here for BCG, a vaccine that usually has really high coverage because it's given as a birth dose in hospital. You can see that from 2019, you know, we came down in, uh, from 2019, and then we haven't really gone up after that. There has been a lot of effort recently that has been focused on trying to address the issue of zero dose children. This includes my mapping using the techniques that were developed in polio to identify areas where children are not being immunized. And then to address those, it's, uh, there's also Mission Indradhanush and intensified Mission Indradhanush that are targeting unreached children. And we hope that this will result in an improvement, but until we get this year's coverage report, we will not know whether that is the case. Now, if we look at vaccines, you know, we have 80% of the world's population in low and middle income countries, but we actually have about 20% of the use of vaccines. And this is a very real issue. Our private sector can access all the vaccines that are available in high income countries for the most part, not yet mRNA vaccines, but uh, in routine immunization, we don't have many of the vaccines that our children really need. Things are changing. There is a growing volume. There's growing value. There's growing appetite for risk within our vaccine companies. So I hope that things will change. A long time ago, back in 2011, Reno Rapoli came up with this figure, which was talking Generation technologies, new adjuvants, structural vaccinology, synthetic biology, DNA and RNA. Well, we actually have all of these vaccines. Did our companies realize that they were able to make many different kinds of vaccines that they hadn't made before, but they also had the ability that many other companies could not do. So manufacturing capacity for vaccines other than the mRNA vaccines really move from the global north to the global south. India and South Korea and China produced much of the non-mRNA products that have been used around the world. So earlier we used to have old vaccines and then we would take those and make them in LMICs. But now we are in a situation where we actually develop the new vaccines in LMICs and we take them to licensure and from licensure to policy and implementation. So there are plenty of opportunities. I'm going to take you through the stages of life before birth shown in red are the vaccines that we need that are in development, we don't have yet. In green are vaccines that are available that we don't use. In black are vaccines that we have and have used. In gray are vaccines that are close to becoming greens. So if we look pre-birth, if we look at infants and children, 
if we look at adolescents and look at adults and the elderly, I'm just taking you through this to show us that the opportunities for using vaccines to prevent disease are incredible. I'll give you a simple example. Influenza vaccines are not in our program. And if you think about influenza vaccines, at least at the extremes of age, these are vaccines that can truly protect the most vulnerable, and we are not using them yet. There are many other vaccines that are not just for different ages and stages that are needed in India. India doesn't have a rabies vaccination program except post-exposure. It can be available for pre-exposure prophylaxis, but it isn't a program. We don't have a cholera vaccine and we have more cases of cholera than anywhere else in the world. We have more cases of typhoid anywhere else in the world. We have the vaccines, we don't use them yet because these really are diseases of the poor and the most vulnerable. So we can also think about vaccines that the rest of the world needs as well, which is emerging infections. The NIH has identified 25 viral families that are capable of causing outbreaks and pandemics. Now, if we look towards the future, there is an immunization agenda that has been set by WHO that has seven strategic priorities and four core principles. Essentially, everyone, everywhere, at every age, fully benefiting from vaccines for good health and well-being. And to do this, the four core principles are that vaccines need to be people-focused, country-owned, given in partnership, and our programs need to be data-driven. You know, what does the way forward need? We are going to need science for the products and for impact. I showed you this before to tell, us, tell you that the new technologies are here. The targets that we apply them to have to matter to us. And I hope that more and more academics and industry partnerships will do that in the future. I just like to compare development to uptake for two important diseases, COVID-19 and tuberculosis. In COVID-19, we had a global disease burden. There was an urgent need recognized globally. We had multiple manufacturers, multiple platforms. The regulators went out of their way to support the did rolling reviews. Uh, we had rapid clinical trials, we had emergency use authorizations and rapid implementation. Now that's for a disease that's been around three and a half years. What about tuberculosis, a disease that has been with us forever? This is an unevenly distributed disease burden, much more important for low and middle income countries than for high income countries. We haven't really had a new product for a century. It's been difficult to identify manufacturers even when we do have vaccines that people want to take forward. We are asked to follow the standard regulatory pathway and TB is a disease that can be difficult to diagnose in endemic countries with the tests that we have. Clinical trials need three or five years of follow-up to get to an efficacy endpoint. And for implementation, we have no clue how this might work because we already have an existing vaccine that doesn't work very well. But you, if you needed to replace it, you would need to show stonking efficacy and that's unlikely to happen with a disease like TB. We are much more likely to get a vaccine with moderate efficacy. And then of course, we have this other problem in India where if you wanted to really experiment, you have to have people as guinea pigs. There is no question. That's what clinical trials are about. You're trying something out that has not been tried before. And 
uh, media tends to be quite active in making sure that when trials are done, they tend to challenge us sometimes rightfully and sometimes not so clearly for things that can and should be done. A key example of that is what happened with the human papillomavirus vaccines in India, where the questions were raised about the safety of the vaccine when the questions should have been about the conduct of the study. I'd just like to point out that, you know, one of the fears that people have when they embark on vaccine trials is the potential for harm. But if we look at side effects, you know, from aspirin to zinc, there is nothing that we take that is 100% safe. So for us as practitioners of medicine, as people who want to push research and new interventions forward, being able to communicate that we will do an appropriate benefit risk evaluation, that there is nothing that is 100% safe becomes really important and is inadequately done. Finally, assuring access really requires measurement. So whether it is using vaccines in routine immunization, using vaccines during pandemics or developing new tools of various kinds, we really need to make sure that we have accurate measurement because it matters for making policy and for evaluating impact. In LMICs, building siloed surveillance, which is what happens. HIV has its own surveillance. TB has its own surveillance. Malaria has its own surveillance. Rotavirus, we had to build a surveillance program because none existed. That is really wasteful but it is needed in order to drive priority setting. So if we want to look at measuring impact, we can use that in many ways. And it can also show us, as I showed with the maps initially, that it can show us lacunae and performance that could help us investigate the causes for that poorer performance and help us to design new interventions. You know, when we talk about the global goals for sustainable development, only goal three is about good health and well being. But if you do a deep dive into the goals, you can look at all of them from different lenses. So, for example, if you have immunized healthy children, that leads to a productive future workforce, which leads to strong economies, and that supports goal one, which is no poverty. If we look at immunization, it contributes to 14 out of 17 of the sustainable development goals. I'd just like to end by saying access to preventive interventions is a human right. I hope I've convinced you that there continues to be inequity in the world and in India, and there's a lot that we still need to do about it. The first step is recognizing and understanding. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And right in the center there is Dr. Hamid and me. That's our uh, 2019 investiture ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kang. Uh, that was a stimulating and absolutely sweeping lecture. I think it achieved really some of the, it addressed some of the key public health challenges in India, especially linking, I think, immunization to implementation, rollout, issues of mess messaging, distribution. So a lot of very, very exciting points that you've raised there. And I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Hamid, uh, first and foremost, to ask him uh, to, 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 to discuss this with you. Dr. Hamid? Well, it, the last one hour was a fascinating talk by 
Professor Khant. Thank you very, very much for it. And I hope that all those that are listening in will imbibe whatever you've said about access. I think the word access is, is uh, very relevant, not only for vaccines, but for all health needs. And uh, we have a mission statement that says that access to quality drugs uh, is, or to quality affordable drugs is a human right. And that includes vaccines. And that none should be denied medication. And in one of your slides, you showed that only 20% of the world has access to vaccines. And I, I, I think we all as a, uh, the humanity has to look at a greater access to medications that are existing today. We, one of the things that I'm doing today, which will interest you is repurposing. What are the tools we already have in hand that we can use better and in combination, et cetera, et cetera. And I think COVID has been a very good example of how uh, humanity has joined hands all over the world to improve uh, the quality of life among COVID patients over the last three years at least. So your talk has been very, very stimulating. I've enjoyed it very much. I hope Colombia can circulate it far and wide. I'm, I'll insist on that to the, to the people that matter. And uh, let's hope that things improve both in vaccinations, in the quality of life, particularly in countries like India. One of the things that I'd like to raise with you is the question of population. We need uh, to control our population in India. 1.5 billion, 1.65 billion by 2050 uh, is, is, is quite a burden. And if you want access to medicines and vaccines, the less of the population, the more the access. So, and we in our country are doing nothing about family planning at all, which is very sad. I, I'd like your views on some of the things that I'm raising today for the future. Thank you very much. Your talk was fas fascinating and congr congratulations from all of us. Can Thank you very much, Dr. Hamid. Can I just comment on the question of family planning? Please I think do. this also has a lot to do with women's agency in controlling their reproductive life. Access to contraceptives for women is something that is also a problem in low and middle income countries. And for women to be able to space births is really important and continues to be an unaddressed need in India. So I certainly hope that both with the research that's happening on better hormonal contraceptives, but also on non-hormonal contraceptives, that is an area that delivers products that can be easily distributed. I was talking more on the non-hormonal contraception. I think that would be fantastic because I, the, I, you know, at least from my experience, I think uptake is likely to be higher. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll move to a few of the other questions that have come up, uh, Dr. Kang. So one of the questions is about uh, the challenges of scaling. Uh -huh. MRNA te technology and um, how, you know, what is the future for that? In the case of COVID, of course, we were lucky to have the Serum Institute to strike a deal with AstraZeneca. Is there, a f in the future, do you see the MRNA vaccines dominating? Uh, we are continuing to have logistical challenges and how are we going to address them? Yeah, so we do have one company that has an approved MRNA product, which is Genova. And uh, unfortunately, by the time Genova's mRNA vaccine was ready, 
much of the country had already been vaccinated. So the question now is, could it be something that could be used as a booster dose? But Genova's production capacity at the moment is untested because there hasn't been enough of a market for them to expand the scale of manufacturing. I certainly hope that their product will work because it is a little bit unusual in that it is a self-amplifying RNA and seems to have greater heat stability than the products that are made by Pfizer and by Moderna. There are also other companies in India that do not yet have products in clinical testing that are interested in mRNA technologies. But I think this is the technology that not just for vaccines, but also for therapeutics needs to be more widely distributed in the world than it is today. Thank you. We have one more question on some of the challenges relating to vaccination programs that even after years of their inception, uh, in the case, for instance, of acute Japanese encephalitis cases throughout India, um, you know, why is it that there's still so many barriers uh, and so much patchiness in a sort, uh, in a sense, uh, with the program? And is there I a program that... to develop a vaccine for scrub typhus, I must? Uh, so two separate questions. Um, okay, let's go with the JE question first. JE, the problem is data and champions. So we have little bits of data from small studies that have been done in some parts of the country. There's not been an attempt to gather data on a country-wide scale. And that means that decisions are made uh, based on a state driving or for introduction of the vaccine. We have not had a comprehensive look and we don't have a comprehensive program, even though it is now in more than half the districts in the country. Scrub typhus, that is a really challenging target to make a vaccine. But here is an example of a product that would have great utility in South Asia and Southeast Asia, where the maximum burden exists. At the moment, as far as I'm aware, there is nothing in clinical testing for scrub typhus. There are some attempts in the preclinical space to develop vaccines for scrub typhus. Thank you. We have a question by a colleague we know well, uh, Nargis Mistri. In an ideal world, we are able to deliver many of the vaccines listed, uh, but is there likely to be harmful vaccine interactions and experience uh, which could lead to adverse effects across different age groups. And I think this ties up with another question we've had relating to the shingles vaccine for older people and other things. I mean, what, what are likely to be uh, some of the adverse kind of effects and vaccine interactions with so many vaccines being delivered? So one of the things that happens before a vaccine is licensed for a particular indication is that there are safety studies that are done. And especially if you want to introduce a new combination vaccine or you want to co-administer vaccines in public health programs, there will need to be studies that show that co-administration of the vaccines is safe. One of the good things about vaccines is that as far as we know, there are no long-term safety issues with vaccine. If there is going to be a side effect, you will know it in the first few days or first few weeks after vaccination. The problem with vaccines, of course, is that because vaccines are given to healthy people, you want to have a really high safety bar. And if there are interactions uh, that are not detected, in the small studies that are done pre-rollout, you need to have really good signal detection mechanisms for programs. And unfortunately, when it comes to programs in low and middle income countries, signal detection is not a strength. I've always had this question about intersusception and rotavirus vaccines. If we had 
a signal with interception in a vaccine that was developed in a low and middle income country, would we have been able to detect it at all? In the US, you can detect it. It is one in 80,000 vaccinated children have interception associated with rotavirus vaccination. In fact, when the US first introduced the vaccine in 2006, they did studies for about six years saying no intersusception, no intersusception, no intersusception. It was only in the seventh year of the program that they had immunized enough children and had enough data to analyze to be able to detect that tiny signal of intersusception associated with rotavirus. In low and middle income countries, we would not have picked that up. Right, thank you. Uh, Dean Fried had a question also, which is, you know, uh, how do we, how can we prevent declines in vaccination in future pandemics and emergencies? I think for the U.S. that is a problem today and increasingly, I think, for the future. Um, building trust in healthcare systems, building trust in preventive interventions is hard. And that's what we have with communities. For routine immunization in low and middle income countries, we don't see a humongous amount of vaccine hesitancy. It's more that I don't know about vaccines and therefore I don't bring my child or I have no way of getting to, the, the, to uh, a clinic where a child can be immunized. It's very different in high income countries where you have many sources of information. And when those sources sound credible are within your bubble of trusted advisors, then once you've internalized an anti-vaccine message, it's very difficult to try and correct that. So there are a lot of strategies that are being developed to try and do that we will know how successful they are in the future. I hope we never need them in low-income countries. Right. Thank you. Um, I, had a quest uh, I have a question on the relative contribution of vaccines in preventing diseases in the, con in the context of One Health. Well, sometimes I think the veterinarians not sometimes, all the time I think the veterinarians are way ahead of human medicine. The whole concept of herd immunity actually comes from the veterinary field. But they have been using vaccines for a much greater range of diseases than we use in humans. Of course, to develop and use vaccines, the efficacy bar is lower and the safety bar not as high either, but they've really done a tremendous job. We've learned a lot about epidemiology, about disease transmission from people who don't work solely on human health. So I think in terms of thinking about One Health approaches, we have a lot to learn, but we also have to consider where do we need vaccines that could be used in both humans and animals? An example is rabies, right? Where we do have immunization programs for animals with the intention of preventing disease in both animals and in humans. I hope that we'll see more such programs being designed and deployed in the future. Certainly for pandemics, um, you know, if we do come up with 25 type vaccines as the NIH hopes we will, maybe we could look at immunizing animal populations so that we decrease risk. You know, risk comes from a wild animal population that you can't control as well, but also from domestic animals. So at least with domestic animals, we have the opportunity to carry out large scale immunization and prevent, at least decrease that source of risk. Thank you. I want to combine two questions actually, which I think are uh, addressing one of the core, core questions you brought up in your, in your lecture, which is relating to equity, Dr. Kang. 
which is uh, one of the questions is about how can we make sure that, uh, how do we balance really the asymmetries between public facilities versus private facilities in India? Um, how will India look at this uh, to be able to achieve a strong UHC drive? And then of course, the other side of equity, which is how do we think of national versus international? There were a lot of nationalist decisions about uh, you know, access to vaccination. And for some time, India also stopped their export of the COVID-19 vaccines for a period of time to prioritize our own local population. So how do we think of this internally with private and public markets versus also in a global kind of way? Well, you know, we are more than one sixth of the world's population. So I have no problem with nationalism, with products that are made in India. Because if you solve a problem in India, you're actually raising what is happening in the world. Once India solves its problems, there is opportunity to share that also with the world. We did that with the rotavirus vaccine. I think the problems with equity between public and private are the real issue in India. Because most people who make decisions in India don't use public infrastructure. They don't use public hospitals. They don't use public schools or public in the sense of government schools. They don't use government infrastructure that really matters at the front lines. And I think in order to improve that frontline infrastructure, public health care, education. I think what it needs is understanding that the private systems in India cannot solve all our problems. There is a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about trickle down effects, about raising standards. We've tried it. It hasn't really worked. So I think unless you have strong public systems, you're not going to solve problems in India. There is a push to push us more towards an insurance model. And um, I have not seen an insurance model that has worked. In many states, including the states that have started all these chief ministers, health insurance schemes, as well as what we have now with uh, some of the national programs, it benefits a section of the population for a subset of conditions. It is not universal health coverage. So we really do have a long way to go. Thank you. I had a state specific question again about uh, vaccination barriers, especially in a state uh, like Bihar. Is there any kind of uh, competitive analysis in terms of demand and supply challenges? You know, how can we possibly understand some states, some populations that constantly remain marginalized or as um, outliers? And are these then case studies or cases for us to understand barriers elsewhere? So there has been a lot of work trying to improve immunization programs in Bihar, and there has been some improvement. But the basic challenge ultimately is people to deliver the services. You need trained people, you need trusted people. And if you don't have a system that has sufficient well-trained people to deliver the services that are required where they are required, you're not going to be able to build any kind of health service. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot more questions, but I'm hoping that maybe we will put this out and uh, people can be in touch with you and we can have more interaction as it goes by. But I first want to thank you, of course, personally, but I'd like to turn to Dean Freed um, to, uh, so that she can say the last few words. Well, thank you, Kavita and Dr. Kang. Um, thank you for an extraordinary, elegant talk, which took us from... Um, everything from the rationale for vaccination to the capabilities to how to accomplish them and where we need to go. Um, really a fantastic presentation, which I think many of us will watch over and over. Thank you. Um, and to 
Dr. Hamid, thank you for bringing us all together. I think the, the bilateral learning in this fantastic um, lecture series and uh, Hamid Faculty Scholars Program, I think has is setting a framework for how we really can build together uh, accomplishments going forward that, that hopefully go well beyond what each of us can do alone. Uh, I, I deeply appreciate the, the learnings from today's Grand Rounds. Uh, looking at the questions, I can see that we had a lot of other people who felt the same way. And I'm just thrilled to have the privilege of being part of this. Thank you. Yusuf, um, it would be appropriate to give, uh, to give you the last word if you would like it. I think these lectures that you have arranged, you and Kavita over the last few years uh, have been absolutely wonderful, educational. And the only thing I'd like you to organize is that whatever talks You've in the past and even today's uh, lecture by Professor Kang should be circulated far and wide. That we will we'll look forward to doing that. And if you need any help on that, please let me know. That would be a pleasure, always. Thank you. Thanks and to everybody. Kang, I'm sorry. Keep up your good work. India needs people like you to do your very best, the country. Thanks. Oh, thank, thanks to you, Yusuf, Dr. Khan, thank you, uh, Kavita, thank you. And thanks to everybody who joined us. Uh, this makes for uh, a very exciting basis for the way forward. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful evening wherever you are. <laughs>